Hello, this is Frank Falvey with Frank Presents, and today we're off to the uh, State House. Uh, uh, thanks to Franklin TV and to Chris Flynn, uh, who's going to be our director, cameraman, and everything else. I've always had a fascination uh, with the State House, uh, and Jeff Roy does a superb tour uh, that he's uh, really boned up on, he knows his history, and so today we're going to explore the State House in its many uh, different aspects and way, and we're going to begin right now with Jeff outside of his door. We're here at uh, the place that you begin your tours? Yes, indeed. And Bullfinch constructed this building, right? Right, right. and this is uh, a scale on a, a uh a model, scale model of the original State House as it was built. Construction began in 1795, it was completed in 1798, and this is what the building uh, looked like. And I always like to start the tour at this model to orient people uh, to what they're saying. So I know uh, you're looking at the, uh, the door uh, right here where it says emergency exit only alarm will sound, so we won't open that door. But to orient you to where that is, if you look right under this archway here, that's where that door is. So we're on the uh, first floor um, of the State House, and uh, it's an original building designed by Bullfinch. The dome at the top uh, has been gold ever since Paul Revere got the idea that it should be painted gold, and there's only one uh, series of time when it was not painted gold, and that was during World War II. They painted that dome uh, gray so it wasn't a target for aircraft. And up at the very Did it ever possess a little gold in it? It, it always has, the, it's real gold in that uh, paint on the roof. And if you look at the very top, there's a pine cone at the very top of the uh, State House. Maine was part of Massachusetts back in that time, and the pine industry was very important to the Commonwealth, and that's a, uh, a symbol of uh, the pine industry. That pine cone actually underwent renovation uh, last year, and uh, they uh, reconditioned it, and it also became a uh, lightning rod for the oh. State House, so it serves a, a dual purpose. The other thing, if you look at the side of the building, you'll notice it's not very narrow. In fact, there are only five windows. So you're standing in the original uh, hallway. So from that door, right on that side, to that staircase is the width of this building. That's how small this State House was when it originally opened wow, in 1798. So uh, we'll talk about the additions that they've done on this building, but for, uh, for the early 100 years, that's the, uh, the width of the building. And you'll see that on this side of the building, this is where the governor's office was. The House of Representatives, which is the body that I serve in, uh, was underneath the Golden Dome. The Senate sits there today. And then on this side of the building is where the Senate chamber originally was in 1798. And today, that's the uh, Senate reading room. Uh, I look forward to taking you upstairs to see both. Uh, and as I said, when the, uh, when the house moved from underneath the Golden Dome to the uh, newest part of the building, the Senate moved into that, uh, that chamber. Can you tell why they named this Doric Hall? I don't know the word Doric. The Doric columns. Oh, these columns these are, are all called Doric, Doric? Doric columns, yes, indeed. And are these uh, Greek or Roman columns? Uh, I, that I mean, would, where, where does the Doric column come from? It's, it's a, uh, a Greek style of building. So it's and, a Greek style column. Exactly, exactly. One of the things, the first stops in Doric Hall that I like to take people to is I like to uh, show them this very raw, rare portrait of Abraham Lincoln. It's a rare portrait because Abraham Lincoln did not like to be either photographed or painted in a standing position because he was very tall and uh, in 1860 it was not uh, uh, common to be over six feet tall and he felt that it was odd so he did not like to be 
painted or photographed in that position. Another thing about that particular portrait, if you look at the face, that's the face that you used to see on the $5 bill yeah. of Abraham Lincoln. It's, uh, it's since changed. And the other interesting thing about uh, this... Was the portrait done before he was president or after? This would be after he was president. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting piece, now we talk about budgets and, and governments running out of money. That's something we hear about uh, all the time. Uh, it's not something that's a phenomenon that's new. Uh, in fact, when this painting was done, artists were paid by the number of arms and limbs that they painted. And you'll notice that Abraham Lincoln's left arm is behind his body. Well, they ran out of money to finish the painting, so they couldn't paint that, paint that additional limb. So it looks stately, but uh, there's actually a financial component to why that left arm is uh, behind him. And if you uh, have heard the expression, it costs an arm and a limb, yeah, yeah. well, that's the that's origin really of that expression. Sure. Some of the, uh, the cannons that you see in this room uh, are from uh, the War of 1812 on one side of the room. And then the on the- Famous question. Yes. When was the War of 1812? Well, I hope it was in 1812. <laughs> And if you look on the other side of the room, those are cannons that were taken from a ship belonging to the East India Tea Company. And if you're a tea party uh, buff, you'll know that it was the tea belonging to the East India Tea Company that was thrown into the harbor in 1775. Which? 1773. Which has a lot of financial implications. Uh, that is a company that first really ran on credit. Uh, people put up money uh, in advance uh, in the hope that uh, the East Indian Tea Company uh, and the other company that's up in Canada, went to Canada, uh, which I can't think of the name of, would return a profit, sure. would return money. So it was the, like the first speculative credit endeavor, uh, uh, or one of the first that, that happened in England. Well, let's go and take a look at some of the statues that are in here. And we start with uh, this statue here, which is uh, General George Washington. And this is the first statue that ever came into the State House. Uh, it was brought here in 1824. And if you look at the statue, you see uh, uh, George Washington is, is wrapped in a rather regal garment. And when they, they originally brought this statue into the State House, there were a lot of people who were upset with the notion that you would bring in somebody who's, who's dressed like a king. And uh, you know, we had fought a revolution rebelling against the king, and America did not want to have a king. And uh, the artist assured the folks here in the State House that that's not George Washington rep, uh, wrapped in any regal gown. That's George Washington wrapped in a and a flag coming off of a field of battle. With that, he was welcomed with open arms into the State House, and he stood in that very location since 1824. There is another famous uh, statue of George Washington here in Boston on a horse, and that is in the Boston uh, uh, Gardens, not the old Boston, but, but the Boston Gardens sure. right outside here where the swan boats are, and uh, at one of the entrances, he is uh, uh, riding uh, on, on a horse in a uh, very military uh, type of, a, of a bronze statue. And right over to this side of the uh, room, this is Governor Andrew, uh -huh. who served as governor during the Civil War. Uh, he's widely remembered, and I'll show it to you a little bit later, uh, for bringing the 54th Regiment uh, and oh. sending the first African-American troops uh, into battle in the United States of America. And he was the governor at the time. And uh, of particular note for folks in Franklin, Governor Andrew was the one who dedicated the statue of Horace Mann, which uh, stands out on the front lawn of oh, the State wow. House. Wow. So, so we'll step into the new part of the State House. It was uh, constructed in 1898. Took about 100 years for folks to realize that uh, the building wasn't large enough to conduct 
the business of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we had to expand. And uh, that was in 1898 when they uh, began the expansion. And, and you look around the room. We came out of uh, Doric Hall, and it's kind of you know plaster walls and painted walls, and uh, it's you know not as decorated and, and as soon puritan as you step looking. into right very puritan looking you step in and all of a sudden you see uh, ornate ceilings and marble walls and marble floors and uh, this statue here is uh, general bartlett who was uh, a young general who fought in many uh, campaigns uh, lost his leg in one of the battles and uh, you know had been injured several times in war and, and when he came back at one point uh, they said you know why don't you run for congress uh, or run for office and serve the the people and he said no my my job is on a battlefield and uh, he actually was was killed in his 30s uh, on a field of battle and so wow. he's commemorated uh, in this uh, particular hall obviously a civil war yes um, general yeah so we're going to walk into, again, the, the new part of the building, and this is Nurses Hall. And Nurses Hall uh, is one of the uh, more beautiful uh, places in this building, and it's the first monument to women in the State House. And obviously, you see the statue of the nurses over here to the side, and those are uh, Civil War nurses who uh, attended to the troops, and this is a memorial dedicated to those folks. The other thing that I like to point out uh, in this room are these murals that are up on the wall. Now, it's pretty easy if you look at the one on the left. That's uh, Paul Revere making his very famous ride. I don't think I have to tell you much about that event. No, and you if you look, read Lawrence Powell's poem. There you go. And if you look on the right, that's the Boston Tea Party on that side of the room. Yeah. And I think everybody's familiar with that particular event. But if you look at the mural that's in the middle of the room, it's the larger of the three murals, but most people who come in here have no idea what's commemorated in that mural. And I'll tell you uh, that that's probably one of the most significant events uh, leading up to the American Revolution. That's James T. Otis, who was a lawyer in Boston, Massachusetts who was arguing before the uh, British Crown against writs of assistance. Now, writs of assistance were these pieces of paper that uh, people could buy, could sell, could trade. If you possess this piece of paper, you could walk into anyone's home and had the right to search and seize whatever it was that you wanted. Very anti-American sentiment. Of course, this is 1760 that we're talking about. And James T. Otis was arguing before the British Crown against these writs. He argued in that trial, which took place in the old State House, which is a few blocks from here, argued for over eight hours. He lost that trial. But the significant piece, there was a young man watching that trial, 26 years old. And he wrote in his diary about that event that uh, he saw the flame of li liberty ignited during that trial. And that young man was John Adams. And I think you know what happened 16 years after this trial. But that's probably one of the most significant events in American history. And that's why it occupies such a, a large spot of real estate uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have a new Hall of Flags, so we, uh, we do refer to this as Memorial Hall today. And it's uh, now, where- when, when I was uh, in high school, a, a young man, uh, the flags were in these windows from different battles. And they, a lot of them would be uh, ragged and torn. Right. And, and they would, uh, the flags lined the whole hall. Right. And in the middle here is where uh, people would lie in state. Right. And when I was, uh, uh, as I said, in high school they had military drill. And I was a captain in, uh, in essence, in, in the military at the high school level. And I paid my respects to James Michael Curley. No kidding. Who laid in state here. Um, I, was, was Kennedy the last, uh, uh, Edward Kennedy, was he the last one to lay in state here? Actually, the last one to lay in state here was Governor Salucci 
when he passed away a few years oh. ago. Oh. And uh, in fact, his uh, his coffin was right in the uh, the middle of the in room, the middle, right. as you stated, with a, with an honor guard. Right. And uh, uh, so this, and and again, this dome, okay, uh, I, I learned today is not the gold dome. It's another dome that the sun comes in. I have always been impressed uh, by the beauty of that dome and by, uh, I'm not sure what it is all the circles represent. Well, all those circles represent the 13 original colonies in the United okay. States. Well, there's actually 12 circles on the, uh, uh, on the perimeter and the one right in the middle is it's the great seal of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yeah. And you had mentioned the flags yeah. earlier that hang in this room. Yeah. What you're looking at today are images of those flags. Oh, they're not the, the actual the, flags. The actual flags still exist, yeah. but they were uh, getting in a, in a terrible condition. They were beginning to deteriorate. So those flags are all being reconditioned. There are about three or 400 of them right. in the building. The originals will hang here again, and they'll be on a rotating schedule after they do get reconditioned. So uh, for the time being, we're looking at reproductions of the flags. The one that I like to point out to folks is this flag on the far side of the room. I think it's an absolutely fascinating story. That is a flag that was uh, carried by uh, uh, troops that were engaged in a, in a, in a battle and it's the 21st Massachusetts Infantry. And you're, in the old days, they would be riding on a horse and the flagman would be at the front. And I'm not sure you know, how wise that was to have somebody announcing the troops coming in uh, to Being battle. But front. a very dangerous position to be. But uh, you know, the folks who carried these flags took the job very seriously. And the gentleman in this case uh, was shot. Uh, as he was carrying that flag, but made every effort that he could yeah. to keep, prevent that flag from dropping to the ground and wrapped it tightly against his body. And if you look at that flag, you see some brown stains in the middle. Yeah. And that's actually the blood stains yeah. from the uh, soldier who carried the flag. Very uh, impressive uh, moment and very impressive act of valor by uh, one of our soldiers. And, and, and that goes actually back to um, Scotland, England, uh, the honor of keeping that flag upright. Even, and particularly uh, if you see Civil War uh, footage or reenactments, uh, even when the flag bearer is hit, there is always someone trying to make sure that that flag is upright. And upright and never touches the ground. Right. right. And, I consider this place the holy ground. For me, in the state of Massachusetts, this is the holy ground. This is, this is very uh, sacred ground. It's a memorial hall. Uh, very solemn events take place in here. And one of the events that takes place um, is when, how do these flags get back to the state house? Well, the troops will bring them back from any engagement. And, I, and the center doors that are in front of the State House, right. they're only open on very rare occasions. And one of the rare occasions that they're open are when troops are returning from battle. They'll march up the front steps through the center doors, they'll come through the building, and they'll meet the governor at that circle. And they'll present the flag or the colors to the governor and return them to him. And that's how they'll end up uh, in this particular building. They don't do it often. Uh, they did it uh, two years ago. I happened to be uh, in the State House that day. It's a very solemn and somber ceremony, but uh, impressive nonetheless. And you see them uh, bring the flags to the governor, and then they'll march up the grand staircase and they'll stand around uh, the event holding their flags. Very, very powerful uh, uh, demonstration. And in fact, you'll see uh, that uh, mural that you're looking at uh, shows the first time that uh, troops brought flags back to the State House. That's the front steps of the State House, and the governor is standing uh, at the top of the steps. It happens to be Governor Andrew yeah. in this particular portrait, but that's the ceremony as it begins uh, to return the flags back from, a, from an engagement.
and takes place right in this room. So this is uh, what we call the Great Hall of Flags today. When I was a little kid and I would come and take a tour of the State House, this room didn't exist. In fact, uh, this was exterior space. Uh, brick walls, no floor here, no glass ceiling on the top. It was kind of a, a dumping ground for generators and, and uh, machinery yeah. and really not an attractive place to visit. And it was uh, Governor Dukakis in the late 80s uh, wanted to uh, create a space that people could come and visit the State House, conduct events. Uh, you can see around the room today uh, that there are tables set up, there's a podium set up, they're obviously planning for an event. This room can, uh, can hold several hundred people and uh, you can have, uh, if you belong to an association that wants to have its annual meeting or a rally in the space, this space is, uh, can be rented by anybody in the public and come here and have a space where they can uh, conduct a meeting and it's fabulous space. Well, the, the, the Teacher of the Year Award was right in this room. For uh, Nancy, Nancy Schoen. Schoen, who uh, just retired, was a uh, director of music in Franklin and for years uh, did uh, uh, the seventh and eighth grade at first Horace Mann and then Remington. Uh, I first filmed her when she was about eight months expecting, I think, her son. And she, right here, was the first, in essence, liberal arts teacher uh, that was honored as Teacher of the Year. A well-deserved award that was uh, the, 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 her, her seventh and eighth grade band uh, was there. They played some musical uh, numbers, and it, as you say, I was, was here. Was, yeah. I was at the room. I was on the school committee at the time, and Representative Valley was president. Right, to, Representative uh, Valley right. was here. Right, it was uh, a beautiful it was, event. It was a marvelous uh, use of the space. Now, you look around, and uh, you see that it's got a marble floor. You've got brick walls. You've got a glass ceiling. The first time they tried to conduct a meeting in this space. The vibration. Well, the, the, the speaker, you couldn't hear a word that was happening because it was bouncing all over the place. Well, we do have some very brilliant and bright engineers in this building, and uh, so someone came up with the idea, why don't we fill that room with flags? And that'll help deaden, deaden the sound. So there are 351 communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and every single one of them was invited to send their flag into the State House and uh, most of them hang. You'll notice, if you look around the room, there are some, some blank poles. Some communities still have not sent their flags in, but uh, there are over 300 in the room today, and it really works uh, to deaden the sound. Now, they hang in this hall uh, by the date that uh, each of those uh, communities entered the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So Plymouth, uh, from 1620, is the first flag and then you go around the first row and they go in order of when they join the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We know that Franklin joined the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1778 so in relation to 1620 that's a long time after. So Franklin occupies its spot up on the top row. It's the uh, seventh flag in from the top. right in front of Buckland. Uh, this is a great ceremonial staircase, too. Right. Um, a lot of uh, veterans or military events or, or, or other special events, uh, they will use the staircase to come down and maybe give speeches here right. or, or have ceremonies. Right, right where you are standing is right. typically where the uh, podium will right. be set up. Correct. And then yeah. there'll be chairs all around the room and, right. and uh, it's, a, it's a great backdrop. So as you reach the uh, top of the grand staircase, uh, one of the first things you see is a beautiful stained glass which gives you uh, the history of the seal of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, the current seal is right here in the middle with the Massasoit Indian in the uh, middle of the seal. 
the motto of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Anse Petit Placidum Sub Libertate Quietem. We come in peace, but only peace through liberty. A couple of the things to point out on the state seal, you'll see uh, the Indian has a, an arrow in the downward position, which is a, a symbol of peace. You'll also see at the top of the seal is the um, emblem of the military, which shows the point of the blade is in a downward position, which is also a symbol of peace, but the sharp edge of the blade is raised upward, which uh, signifies the motto that uh, we are at peace right now, but ready to take arms uh, whenever necessary. And as you go around the glass, you'll see some of the uh, varying iterations of the state seal over the years, uh, beginning back in 1628, uh, right up to the uh, seal as it exists today. And it's this grand staircase that uh, leads you up to the house chamber. And this is typically where I do all of my work as a member of the House of Representatives. To try and orient you a bit to uh, where we are in the building, uh, the governor's office, the executive department is all the way at the end of the hall. And uh, we talked about the uh, state of the state address and how they would uh, uh, roll red carpet all the way from the governor's office, would come right down to these center doors of the state house and the ancient artillery uh, guard, honor guard, would be lining that, uh, that hallway and the governor would be invited into the chamber and he would enter through these particular doors. But we'll enter in uh, through the side door of the chamber. This, uh, we're in the House of Representatives chamber. Yes, indeed. And when did this chamber first uh, uh, come into existence? This is part of the 1898 renovation of the building. So, uh, so that's a late renovation. Right. It was about 100 years after the uh, original State House was yeah, open. Yeah. Uh, they did a massive expansion. I mean, it's the State House probably is eight times the original size. Right. Uh, and it occupies a whole city block today, whereas right. it was just a small building on the top of a hill. Right. Uh, and this chamber is, in comparison to what we saw in the Senate chamber, is, is absolutely uh, much larger. Right. Uh, today you look around this room and there are 160 seats in the chamber. There's 160 members of right. the House of Representatives. I'm right. one of them. Right. Each of us representatives uh, serve 40,000 uh, constituents. Okay. So it's 160 representatives yeah. times 40,000 yeah. uh, constituents. That gives you the 6.4 million uh, people uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, back, uh, up until the 70s, uh, the House of Representatives consisted of 240 members. Yeah. So yeah. when this uh, chamber originally opened uh, in 1898, there were in fact 240 desks in the room. So you're looking around the room and you see 160, you have to imagine another 40 desks. They occupied uh, the back row of the room. It and, was uh, like the old Fenway. The old Fenway 13-inch seats are now. You got it. <laughs> and this, uh, this well wasn't uh, as big as it was. Uh, the other thing, you'll see these uh, boards right. on each side of the room right. that have all of the members of the House of Representatives. Uh, you're looking at that side. If you look at the top, it's, that's with the Speaker of the House yeah. and his leadership team. Yeah. And then beginning with Asiero, it goes in alphabetical order down uh, each of the rows over to the other side of the board. We're beginning with the Democrats, and the Democrats in the House go all the way down onto that fifth panel up to Zlotnick. Then we begin with the Republicans with the minority leader, uh, Brad Jones, his leadership team, and then beginning with Barros uh, to Wong. Those are the Republicans uh, in the House. Uh, they're obviously, they're in alphabetical order, and uh, 
I occupy uh, the fourth panel uh, on that side of the room. Those panels are to record uh, the votes of uh, all members of the House. So members of the public are invited into the chamber to see what happens and in order to follow the votes, uh, every time we press either a green or a red button, the light lights up next to our name so uh, people who are in the audience can see exactly how their votes uh, are tallied. You don't even have to be here in the State House to see what happens in these rooms. You, there are TV cameras in here. You can uh, and, watch and it Franklin, in the comfort of your home. What channel is that in Franklin? If they don't have it on, uh, on television, you have to log in online. So the legislature website has a, um, a service that you can uh, watch live during each session of the House. Whether it's a formal session or an informal session, all of the proceedings are broadcast over the internet. Do you know what that uh, uh, website, it, I mean, how do you uh, go into that website? You it's uh, malegislature.gov. Malegislature.gov. Dot dot right, and you can see, uh, you can go to each member of the House and Senate has a page that you can get off of that site. Uh, you can get information on bills. You can sign up for, uh, if there's a particular area of interest, you can sign up and have notices sent to you if you're tracking a particular piece of legislation. It's a great site. It's an award-winning site, one of the best uh, legislative sites in, uh, in the United States of America. And it's actually uh, getting uh, revamped to become uh, new and improved. So it's a, a great resource, and I encourage folks to uh, visit it, visit it often, and uh, stay in touch with your government uh, as it as Now, you involved. also, as a representative, have a website as a representative. I do. And what might that be? That's uh, aside from the site that you can find at malegislature.gov, I have jeffreyroy.com, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y.com, and that uh, will give you uh, information about things that I'm doing in my district uh, more customized to uh, the 10th Norfolk District. I have a newsletter that you can subscribe to by going to that site. Um, I try to keep folks uh, up to date and communicate uh, as much as possible uh, because I th it, this is your government mm -hmm. and I want you to play as much a part in it as possible. Right. If you look up at the back, uh, up above the gallery in the center, that's the sacred cod. Right. And that yeah. sacred cod has provided presided over every session of the House of Representatives since the beginning of Massachusetts history. It was a gift to the uh, House of Representatives by James Rowe, who was a fisherman. Uh, he thought that uh, it would be appropriate, since fishing was such an important part of the Massachusetts economy, right. to give a gift to the legislature. I think he secretly hoped that if he gave a gift to the legislature, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't tax the fishing industry. Uh, and perhaps that lasted for a few years, but, uh, you know, uh, fishing was vitally important to the Commonwealth. So that actually did hang at the old State House, which is a couple of blocks. When uh, we moved to this building in 1798, that fish was wrapped in a flag, uh, marched up State Street and brought in a, in a ceremony into the uh, original House chamber, which sat underneath the Golden Dome, and it hung there for 100 years. Yeah. And when the House moved into this chamber, again, that fish was wrapped in a flag, and marched into this uh, spot where it hangs uh, in this room uh, to this day. Now, it's, it's pointed in a true north direction. There's also uh, a myth that it points in that direction when the Democrats control the House right. and in the opposite direction when the Republicans control the House. And I think when we were looking at the boards, uh, you probably saw that uh, there were five columns of... Uh, of Democrats in the House and uh, uh, one and a half columns of Republicans. Uh, the actual breakdown of the 160 members today is 126 Democrats and 34 Republicans. But uh, you might think that uh, uh, that leads to animosity, but I can tell you uh, the culture uh -huh. and the camaraderie that exists in this building is, is amazing. It's not like what you uh, see in Washington, D.C. We actually get along, we work along, uh, side one another, 
And sometimes it's difficult to tell who the Republicans are and who the Democrats are because they see us having fun. I mean, right. uh, Senator Ross is a, a, a Republican. I'm a Democrat, but we have a, a fantastic relationship. Right. We know that those letters don't mean anything when you're in this building. You're right. here to represent your right. constituents and to do the best job you have to work with your colleagues. So this is uh, where the Speaker of the House uh, uh -huh. presides and they stop in the front because uh, there's a plaque uh, in front of the rostrum that commemorates uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, last speech in the Massachusetts House of Representatives that he delivered on January 9th of 1961. Now, uh, John was never elected to a, um, how do I say it, a, uh, uh, either the Senate or the House of Representatives. Right, right. he went he, right to Congress. He, he went, uh, Right um, to Congress. In fact, one of the people running against him was a woman who was a nurse, I believe, from Cambridge, with the last name of Falby. No kidding. Any uh, relation? I have no idea. I don't think so. Well, I, I do not believe so. But I found that when I came across it, uh, quite quite uh, fascinating. She was uh, apparently a nurse, and uh, she was running against him in. Uh, in a ward not far from here. Well, one of the things that I had mentioned when we were downstairs was the center doors to the State House right. that are open on uh, li very limited occasions. Right. Right. Well, one of the occasions is when a President of the United States comes right. to visit the State House. And I always ask folks who come in to the State House if they know who the last President of the United States was to visit the uh, Massachusetts State House. Now, obviously, we're standing in front of a plaque right. uh, that talks about John F. Kennedy, so uh, perhaps that might uh, provide a clue to you, but uh, who do you think it was? Uh, and I'll tell you, it was not John F. Kennedy. Yeah, I don't believe it was Kennedy. Um, I, uh, um, well, you're not going to believe it when I tell you. It's going to be a Republican. It, it, it was a Republican. It's going to be a fact. Republican, and I would almost say it's going to be the elder Bush. All right. It was William Howard Taft back in 1908. Well, I thought you said the last that's, president. That's the last president. Well, he was president. John F. When Kennedy. He spoke here. John F. Kennedy was not the president. He spoke here on January 9th. Oh. And he, he didn't get sworn into office till January 20th, 11 days later. <laughs> so when he came to visit the state house on January 9th, he came in the very same door that you walked in. They did not open the center doors for him because he wasn't uh, president. Well, let me share with you uh, 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 these names that you see yeah. along the frieze yeah. uh, on the ceiling of the building. Those are the names of 53 men who contributed to making the Commonwealth of Massachusetts what it is today. And I emphasize men, right? Let me point out, in the middle there over the fish is Parkman. Parkman. Francis Parkman. I went to the seventh and eighth grade uh, of school named Francis Parkman. Later in my life, I found that he wrote the Oregon Trail. He lived uh, in the Jamaica Way, and he wrote uh, uh, volumes, uh, three, three volumes on the uh, war in Canada between the French and the British. Uh, and he is an excellent descriptive writer right. of wildlife. Well, you highlighted one of the things I was going to tell you about these 53 names. It's not all politicians. Yeah. It's uh, authors and poets, and, uh, and there are certainly politicians up on there. Horace Mann, yeah. again, yeah. is uh, commemorated as one of the names uh, in this building. And I had said earlier that it was 53 men. Uh, yeah. Keep in mind, this room was built in 1898, yeah. and women didn't have the right to vote. Until 1920, 21. right? 20? So 1920. So and, and who was the first woman elected to this body? Excellent question. Do you know? And when? No, I don't. I would guess it was in the 60s. Yeah. Only we'll, we'll have to find guess. out. I, I, you know, I uh, you you raise a, a, a very interesting point. Uh, to date, yeah. the Commonwealth of Massachusetts still has not elected a woman 
to serve as governor of no. the Commonwealth. We had Jane, uh, Jane, Jane Swift, Swift. Uh, came by default. She was the acting William governor. William Weld made a terrible political blunder when he resigned the governorship and, and thought that the uh, chairman of the Senate committee to appoint him ambassador to Mexico would ever change it. Strong, strong sermon, right? right? I mean, why, why Weld is running on the libertarian uh, ticket uh, after that complete political fiasco is beyond my comprehension. Well, it, it's something that happened, but she served as, as the acting governor. Um, so we did have a woman governor, but we still have not elected. Uh, a woman governor. We're here in uh, Representative Jeff Roy's office, and, and Jeff, as representatives uh, tend to do, both on a state or a federal level, they personalize their office. Right. And, and it brings out kind of who you are a, as a person. Uh, so take us through some of the uh, memorabilia or the significance of sure. the... Uh, of the would love to. Uh, obviously, you've been to a Red Sox game. Well, I am a big Red Sox fan, and uh, you know uh, these uh, pictures over here are, are tickets from the uh, World Series game. Those are my actual uh, tickets, and there is a company that uh, used to be in Medway. They've they've since moved, um, but uh, their their business was uh, creating memorabilia. So they would actually take my tickets, blow them up, and uh, put them on canvas. And, uh, you know, the tickets typically sit in your drawer and gather dust, and uh, well, I thought this was a nice way to uh, display them and, uh, you know, be a boost for a company that's in my district. I try to get as much in this office that represents a flavor of what's happening uh, in Franklin and Medway, and so much of the stuff that you will see uh, is here. I need to tell you that I've collected ticket stubs since the mid 1950s, uh, I have. Uh, uh, when the Braves move out, moved out of Boston, they used to come back and play the Red Sox for a Jimmy Fund game, and I have tickets from that. I have tickets from the uh, uh, English uh, Latin game, so I have I don't know four or five uh, books of tickets uh, uh, from different events I've been to. Uh, in hopes that someone remembers when I die to bring him to the funeral parlor and people can look through, you know, the places. You know, uh, you're a you man know. after my own heart. I have, I have the tickets from when I was a little kid and I would go to baseball games and things like that. I, I keep them all and I just thought yeah. that this was a nice way to... Uh, and and now those. we're in trouble because I went to the Big E the other day, right? Yeah. No ticket. I mean, yeah. th there's, they're doing away with tickets. Right. They just have right. a barcode thing and yeah. go ahead. You, sure. We have Time Magazine. A Time Magazine. Uh, people say, why on earth would you have a picture of Nikita Khrushchev yeah. in your office? Well, it's actually the Time Magazine from September 8, 1961, which was the day I was born. Um, and, you know, when I saw that cover, uh, it really reminded me of how terrible things can get in the world mm -hmm. and how important it is for a government to make your community and your state and your country a great place to live, work, and raise a family. So I go back and I look at that uh, as a reminder from when I was right. born how bad things could get. And uh, it reminds me every day that uh, uh, we're here about improvement. At least he's um, not paying in a shoe. Exactly. I think he did that after that. Uh, this is the first uh, bill I ever got through uh, the House of Representatives. It was uh, Act uh, Chapter 39 uh, from the Acts of 2013. So uh, uh, we had that framed, my uh, Pan Mass uh, bicycle team. Uh, this is uh, the mother-daughter team, the K-Girls, that uh, were the first mother and daughter team to run uh, um, she pushed her daughter in the wheelchair, and uh, if you recall, in 2013, uh, that's when the marathon bomb right. went off. Right. They were about uh, 25 to 30 feet from the finish line, oh, wow. and were not able to cross the finish line on that day. So the YMCA right. in Franklin had actually had a um, commemoration uh, about a month later, 
to uh, present them with their marathon medals, and they asked me to put the medals on the uh, the K girls. They're from uh, Menden, Massachusetts, but they uh, were uh, residents of uh, Franklin that uh, before that. So that was a, a, a special moment. Some artwork from uh, Peter Willis, who's uh, a young man from Franklin. Uh, who, uh, when he came to take a tour of the State House, he brought me that as a, as a gift, as a Massachusetts uh, landmark. And, uh, now, uh, now, is that the original or is that the reconstructed one? The original right got wiped out with a hurricane. Right. I would I say remember. that's uh, a, the reconstructed one because that's an actual yeah. photograph that yeah. he took in, in 2014 yeah. Uh, yeah. and had it blown up. But uh, yeah. Peter, when he came, said, my father told me that my uh, great-grandfather was a governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So we spent the time that he was here, uh, all the portraits of the past governors hang right, right. Uh, on the floor, right. but they don't hang in any particular order. So as we were walking around taking the tour, uh, we were looking for his, uh, his great-grandfather, and we actually found him uh, and got a picture of Peter wow. with his great-grandfather. Wow. Uh, over the course of uh, serving, um, I collect a lot of uh, lapel pins mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, obviously can't wear them. Right. So uh, we decided that we would display those. Uh, the flags that uh, are hanging in the Hall of Flags uh, in Memorial Hall in the State House, that's a, a poster of them. Yeah. Uh, one, you know, I've received some nice awards uh, over the uh, past couple of years and so we, uh, we put them on display. And, uh, then we have uh, this uh, rack here that's got, you know, more awards and, and gifts that uh, I may have obtained. You'll look, uh, I've done a lot of work with manufacturing, uh -huh. and uh, this was actually created uh, with some of the new equipment that we uh, obtained oh, for wow. the Tri-County School, uh, mm -hmm. a CNC machine where they actually created that and yeah. uh, kept that. Uh, Martin Luther King, Jr., yeah. Speaking from the rostrum, yeah. in, uh, in April of 1965, we commemorated the 50th anniversary of that speech uh, in, um, in 2015. Um, I, I made a joke, because this office used to be occupied by uh, Mayor Walsh. This was his <laughs> office, and when he left, uh, I, was, uh, I was given this office. And uh, I saw the mayor. Um, shortly after he became mayor and I moved into the office and the place was empty and I said, uh, Mayor, I said, it's tradition when you leave an office, uh, you know, you should leave a note or a gift to the person who takes over your office and there was absolutely nothing there and, um, and uh, he said, well, there's a box of stuff out uh, in the hallway and I looked and sure enough there was a Sandy Koufax signed baseball uh, in the uh, in the box of stuff that he had. So I, wow. I treat this as my gift from the wow. mayor. Wow, wow. We have a horseshoe from uh, the agricultural school in Norfolk. Um, we have some, this is actually a, uh, a Narcan administration kit. Mm -hmm. Some soaps from, uh, from one of the companies in, in Medway that we keep here and, uh, you know, books having to do with uh, Horace Mann. And you have uh, a Frank. panther over the, over the top of the shelf. Well, that panther is from the old Franklin High School before they were demolishing it. We were trying to get a piece of uh, memorabilia, and uh, so they uh, made, a, made arrangements for me to get that uh, panther that used to hung, hang over the uh, door for the, um, for the field house. So uh, if anybody's looking for it, it's, uh, it's right here <laughs> in the state house. Uh, you know, hats and law books that we keep there. Uh, that particular um, image right here is all of the folks uh, who were elected to the uh, House of Representatives in 2012 along with me. So uh, that's uh, our class got together. Uh, you treat it like, a, any, yeah. like any high school class yeah. and uh, uh, we did that nice poster. Uh, the uh, marathon finish line with uh, the Boston Strong. Uh, I was attracted to that photograph because my law office, which is where I worked for 28 years before coming to the State House, is on the top right of that particular that, photograph. That's also the uh, Amer uh, World Series uh, championship? That is certainly. Trophy? That's the 2013 uh, World Series trophy. 
Uh, this particular uh, um, is a page from the calendar uh, of my great-grandfather, Joseph Morcone, uh, who in 1895, he was the first uh, person of Italian heritage to vote in, uh, in Milford, Massachusetts. And really? He came from Italy in, in 1895, uh, and he, um, he was a Republican. And people say, uh, would your great-grandfather be proud of you today uh, knowing that you're a Democrat. And I said, well, I, I, I'll put it to you this way. He was a Republican in the area of Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt uh, stood for many things that the Democrats stand for today. Okay. And I, so I say, I dare say that he would be very, very proud to see uh, what, what we're doing here today. He was a banker, a maritime agent, a grocer, an insurance salesman, uh, and out of this uh, one office that stood uh, for generations in, in Milford. Uh, it just uh, got torn down uh, about a year ago, and it's now an office building. But uh, he was a, a great person, and we found that uh, calendar from January 1911 uh, among his, uh, his uh, uh, papers. And, uh, these are uh, some highlights from Franklin Horace Mann High, Ben Franklin Monument, the Horace Mann Memorial, and the Dean Academy. And I, this I just got uh, a week or so ago. Uh, this is a photograph. I went to the gallery in Medway that they were putting on historical photographs from Franklin. And that's actually the ceremony from the dedication of the Horace Mann Memorial uh, down at the, um, uh, oh, yeah. the, plaza, yeah, the plaza from yeah. 1929. So yeah. that's yeah. what it looked like. And that's the day uh, that that uh, was dedicated. Yeah. Franklin High School project uh, that uh, was very proud of and the work uh, from the school committee and town council days. That's a project that started when I was the chairman of the school committee, funded when I was on the town council, and the grand opening uh, took place when I was a state representative. So I saw three different jobs uh, during the course of that project and, and the shovel from the groundbreaking is there. And uh, these here are some newspaper clippings uh, that uh, of, of interest and my uh, alma mater Bates College I have a, a chair from uh, school so you know that's basically uh, trying to capture images from uh, the district and yeah. uh, keeping them on display here uh, my sister gave me a gift of uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, you know it's just great memorabilia just to keep me in the correct frame of mind when I'm working here. Well, that is absolutely wonderful. Um, well, this is a great space to work out of. It uh, is. Uh, and you always have thoroughly enjoyed uh, being a representative. Right. This is, I'm, I'm finishing my fourth year uh, in my second term, um, and I still have that energy and enthusiasm when I walk into the building. It excites me to come in and work in here. And one of the things that I really like to do is have people come in from the district to see the building in operation. And, and I'm hoping that with this video, people will have a chance that can't get into the city of Boston, will uh, get to see the building come alive. And I think develop, hopefully, a deeper appreciation from what happens in their government on a day-to-day -day basis. I think when you see it firsthand, yeah. uh, it's, it's much different than what you read about right. in a newspaper story or a 60-second or a piece on, on television. And the connection between uh, this state house on Beacon Hill and the local community of Franklin and Medway. Right. There is a very uh, meaningful connection that goes both ways. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I'm honored and I feel blessed every day to be able to represent uh, the, the folks in Franklin and Medway, and I, uh, I can't thank folks enough for giving me this opportunity, and I hope to uh, serve uh, to the best of my ability and uh, you know, honor their choice to have me serve as their state representative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.